Parshas Achrei Mos, by the Bera di Noya Moshe, Achrei Mos, Shnei Bnei Aroma, cover of some of me, the Novia Musa. God spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they came before Hashem and they died. Remember when they died? They died in last week's portion. Well, not last week's in Shmini. Then we had a break of Tazrim and Torah, and now we go back to it. Hashem speaks to Moshe. So the Mara says, why is it telling us this? So Rebbe Lazar ben Azaria said, this is a parable to a sick person whom a doctor visited. Amarlo, doctor said to him, doctor said to him, don't eat a radish. And he says, don't, he, the doctor says to him, the doctor says to him, uh, don't sleep in a tachav. Tachav is like damp. So then the second doctor comes and says, don't eat radishes or sleep in a damp place because what's going to happen to you is you'll die like the other person died. So the second person is going to be, the second doctor is going to be more persuasive than the first. Therefore, it says, Achare mos because this portion is going to teach us about what's the proper way to enter into the sanctuary. So you don't die like Nadav and Avihu died in the previous portion. Okay, verse two, second Pesach, Vayomer Hashem Moshe. God says to Moshe, speak to Aaron, your brother. You don't come into the temple. You can't come into the temple sanctuary whenever you want me. To the sanctuary, which is inside the parochet. To the kaporet. The parochet is the curtain and separates the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. And the uh, kaporet is the cover for the ark. Asherah Aaron Moyamut. So lest it be on the on the coffin on the ark, so you don't die. Kiba non Israel kaporet. Because with the cloud, I will appear above the kaporet. So God says to Moshe, tell Aaron you can't come into the holy of holies whenever you want, because that's where I am. Uh, she says. Speak to Aaron and tell him not to come. So he doesn't die like his uh, sons died. If he goes there whenever he wants, he's going to die. Because in the cloud, I will be, Rashi says, I'm always going to be there. With my pillar of cloud. My Divine presence is visible there. So therefore, So therefore, you have to be careful not to come because that's God's place. That's the literal explanation. No, the Midrash teaches us you can only come with a different cloud, the cloud of the incense of your Anyom Kippur. That's the Midrash. Bezos. Verse three, but this Aaron can come to the Kodesh, to the sanctuary, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for an Oa. Oh, welcome. We are gonna welcome Dr. Shore. Uh, he's, he's connecting to audio. Welcome to Dr. Shore. Great honor to have you with us. Great honor. Uh, you're muted, but it's okay. We like you like this. That's okay. With this, you shall come to the Kodesh. Rashi says, Bezot, Kematria, Shalom, Arba, Meot, Ve'eser. 410. That corresponds to Lebayit Rishon. The temple, the first temple, stood for 410 years before it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar. Bezot, Yavo, Aaron, and with this, Aaron will come. 
and even when Aaron comes with this prescribed ritual, he cannot come whenever he wants. Only on Yom Kippur he could come. It says at the end of the paragraph on the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. That's the only time he's able to come. Um, it says later on in the portion, it says the following here. It says, uh, he actually says, let's get the exact first. Um, it says, that, look at um, chapter, verse 29 and 30. And this will be a law for you in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month. And then it says, you have to afflict your souls, do not do any work. Because on this day, it will be an atonement for you. Yechaper alechem. So that, and it'll be the sh- Sabbath of Sabbaths. And that is, uh, that's the references. All those verses are referring to Yom Kippur. That is, uh, this is the source. This is the, and this is the Torah reading on Yom Kippur. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's between what? Between verse three and verse. Well, it's all leading up to it. That's the end yeah, of the same paragraph. Right. So this is the ritual that Aaron is supposed to do, but he's only allowed to do this ritual that one day a year. So normally Aaron wears the, the priestly garments, which are eight garments, which are ornate and elaborate, and they have gold in them. But on, Yom, but on this one day of the year, he, he dresses differently. He wears a linen, his linen garments. He wears his breeches. And he wears a linen belt. And he just wears a regular turban. Big day code of shame. These are sacred garments. And then he washes his body in water, and then he puts on these garments. So Rashi tells us as follows, when he, when he, when he serves inside the, the temple, he does not wear the eight priestly garments. When he, when he serves in the, in the rest of the temple, he wears the eight garments. Because they have gold in them. The, the, we do not make the prosecutor into the defense attorney. What does that mean? He only wears the four garments of the regular Kohen, and those are made of linen. Why doesn't he wear the gold? Because she tells us, from we don't make the prosecutor into the defense attorney. Even though in America, in, in the United States government, that's p- typically what happens after the guy's in the a U.S. attorney becomes a high-priced defense attorney at some major law firm like Kirkland and Ellis or Paul Weiss, whatever. But in the Torah, we're saying you're not supposed to do that. And the prosecutor, what's the prosecutor? Gold, because we sit with the golden calf. And so therefore, oh, I just realized when I go to Mount Sinai, I'm not, I won't wear my gold bekesha because in Kategor Nasa Senega, we can't make the, uh, doesn't feel right to wear the golden, golden bekesha to Harasina. I just realized that. Okay. So what do you do? I'll wear my white bekesha then. Can't wear gold bekesha to Harasina. It's a bad, bad look. It's a bad look. Okay. God forbid. Okay. And and Kodesh Yobashi wears the holy garments. Rashi says, Shayu Mishal Kodesh. They have to be owned by the temple. Yitznof. And he'll wear a turban of linen. Kitargamo. Yachis Beresha. Yaniach Berosho. And let them rest on his head. Like Matanach Pigdo Viachte. Is it a turban or a mug? I don't know what a mitre is. Mitre is straight. Uh, you know, it's you know, like this. And a turban is pretty bad. So it's a very good question, Steve is asking. The mitznefis is not directly described. I don't even know that it's directly described 
in the Talmud. I'm off the top of my head, I don't remember a direct description of the mitznefes, of the tur of the hat that he wear wore even in the Talmud. So there are most of the drawings of it that I've seen depicted as a miter rather than a turban. Right, like the Well, they probably, but I mean, Rabbi Yosef, you could do a Google image from it, but I don't believe that the Talmud ever directly describes how the mitznefes, how the turban looks. That's just, or I called it a turban, how the hat looks. Verachatz mm b'mayim. -hmm. And he washes it himself in water. Oh, so I, you know, on that day, which ironically is a day that every Jew is not allowed to wash, that day, Yom Kippur, ta'un every time he changes his clothes, he has to wash his, to wash himself. Five times he would exchange, he would change his garments from, from, his service inside to his service outside. Meaning to say five times he, cha he would change himself. He would change from the gold to, from the white to the gold and from the, go the gold to the white. Um, shanam, he big day zav, big day love. And he would change from gold to white and, and from white to gold. The kol khalifa, every time he changes garments, taunt view, I required immersion. Ushnei kidusha yadai, and each time he changed, before he changed, he would wash his hands and feet from the basin. And after he changed, he wash his hands and feet again from the basin. Verse 5. And from the congregation of Israel, he should take two goats for a sin offering. And one ram for an oa. Verse 6, Hello there, my dear friend Eliezer. And Aaron, where's your friend? He's in the kitchen. He's okay? Yeah. And Aaron should bring the bull as a sin offering. I'll be atonement for him and for his whole household. So first we just said, you're drinking the peanut butter soup? Yep. <laughs> Did you ever have peanut butter soup before? Yeah, it's a Brazilian food. What? Um, there's Brazilian peanut too. There's yeah, it's an African, 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 African special soup from Africa. Somalia, there's yeah. Somalia. I know it anyway. Okay, well, okay, that's a tangent. That's a tangent. We're studying Rashi. Rashi never had peanut peanuts. There weren't peanuts in Rashi's time. Uh, there was no peanuts in uh, Northern yeah. Europe in the 11th century. No chance. I never heard of that. I mean, I, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I never, no. I can't imagine that they were, they had that there. So if no, I- No, they're from the new country. Yeah. yeah. But did so, you see the picture that I, that I showed? Let me see, no, I don't see it. Where is it? I, you know, you were paid attention to something else. But... Okay, what did I ask you for a picture of? The Mitznefet. Yeah, but there's, but there's no basis for it is what I'm trying to say. What's the basis for it? They're just imagining, unless if you can find me a citation from the Talmud about what it looked like, that's my You question. said Google Images. <laughs> yeah, but the Google Images would say what's, soar, what's the source. I don't, uh, so anyway, Aaron brought the boa, boa as a sin offering, and it was atonement for himself and for his household. So he had two goats from the congregation of Israel, and then for himself, he brought a boa as a sin offering. So Rashi says, at parachatasa shelo, amor lamala, this bull as a sin offering. Uh, this was said earlier that he has to bring a bull. It says, where does it say a bull? It says, in verse three, he takes a bull as a sin offering. So why is it being repeated? To tell us, he has to pay for it himself. He can't use the community's funds. And there was an atonement for him, for his household. Rashi says, confesses upon it his own sins and the sins of his household. Verse 7. And he should take the two goats and meet some of Hashem. And then he stands them up before God.
you should take the two goats and stand them up before God, Pesach or Moed, at the entrance to the tent. What does that mean? No, it doesn't tell us. He takes the two goats. And he shall put on the two goats lots. One, one lot to God. One goat is going to be designated to God. And one goat is going to be designated for Azazel. Rashi does, let's see what Rashi says. He doesn't Rashi doesn't tell us what he thinks this is. He puts lots on two goats. He puts one on his right, one on his left. And he puts both his hands on the lots. And he takes a, a, a lot in his right hand and a lot in his left hand. And he puts it on the goats. The one that says, for the name, who is shame? That's for God. And the one that says, Lazazel, it's sent off to Azazel. What is Azazel? Who are Az? It's a mountain that is Oz Vikashe. This is a mountain which is, which is Kashe means hard. Az means uh, maybe flinty or strong or sh- steep. Gavoa, and it's high. Shenemer Eretz Kizera Chatucha, a land that is sharp and cut. So that's what Rashi says is Azazel, land that is Az, as mighty and, 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 and difficult, as Rashi says. Okay. Verse. There's a lot of confusion. This is Rashi. I say that's all Rashi. A lot of people have a, another word for Azazel is a demon. So, which is strange. Why is he making an offering to a demon? Even Ezra and Rabban here are... are Pacification. What? Pacification. Yeah, well, we don't want to say that, but <laughs> Steve I is... Do you, do you have a footnote there about Azazel in your... In your what? what? Very interesting. Vasel Chatas, he makes it as a sin offering. My verse 9. So one is a sin offering and one is something else, right? Well, it doesn't, uh, right. Well, that's what he says here. That's what verse nine says. And Aaron should bring the goat that is, uh, that is, has the lot on it for God. He should make it into a sin offering. Well, she says, He says, this will be for God as a sin offering. Verse 10, the one that says to Azazel, should stand, will remain alive before God to be an atonement. To send it out to Azazel in the wilderness. What does this mean? Uh, she says, will stand alive. Meaning others will keep it alive. So the go- this goat will be kept alive by others. So what does that mean? It says to send it out to Azazel. It says to send it out to Azazel. I don't know if you're being sent off to die, to die or to live. Therefore, it states, we'll keep it alive. Meaning to say, when it stands, it's alive. But once it stands off, it's going to die. That's what he's saying. That's what Rashi says. And that's what, the, that's what Rashi says. And the, I'm trying to say, does the Talmud say that? It, I'm trying to remember if the Talmud explicitly says that. Let's see if Rashi has a source here. No, Rashi. Rashi does not say the Talmud, and I'm trying to remember if it said that explicitly in the Talmud. I don't remember the Talmud saying that explicitly. It says here in Sifri. Right, so it's not in the Talmud. Sifra, sorry. Sifri is a. Uh... Is Mamid Varan Varan. Sifra is Okay, the next verse says, Vikri Varan and Parachatata Sherlo. 
And Aaron should bring the bull as a sin offering. And it should be an atonement for him and for his household. And Aaron should bring the bull as a sin offering. And it should atone for him and for his household. And it should. And he slaughtered his bull as a sin offering. So it's a second sin offering, but the first sin offering was the sin of all of Israel, and this is Aaron's sin offering. And for his household. The Rashi tells us this is a second confession, which is for himself and for his brothers, the Kohanim. They are all called Beso. The first confession was for his own household. The second confession is for himself and all the Kohanim, as it states, so we see from here that the Kohanim are atoned for him. And what's the atonement for? For entering into the temple while you're ritually impure. As it states, So that's a very severe sin, entering into the temple while you're impure. Basically desecrating the temple. Very, very severe sin. Most people today, we you know, if you ask them, What's, what are we gathering on Yom Kippur for which sins? We have a whole list. But in the Torah, it's a very specific sin entering into the temple in a state of ritual impurity. Now the verse tells us, He takes a pan, coal pan, pan that holds the coals, coals of fire, from the altar, which altar? the altar that's in the courtyard of the temple, from before God, and he holds in his hands a, a, a fistful of very fine incense, and he brings it from the temple into the Holy of Holies. Rashi says, he brings it from the western side of the altar. Daka, matam Why does that have to say it was, it was um, fine? All the incense is fine. And says for shachachtami menadek el shnei daka menadaka, the finest of the fine, very very finely ground. Even though it was normally finely ground. He returned it back into the grinder on the eve of Yom Kippur. Verse 13. And he has to put the incense onto the, and he has to put the incense onto the fire before God. And, he, and the ketoret has to cover the incense. As Sherlock, I do it. The ketoret has to cover the incense the cover on the testimony of William Mood so that it not die. Rashi tells us. So basically, he's taking the incense, putting it on the coal pan, which is fire, and then the cloud of incense will fill up the Holy of Holies and it'll cover over the cover of the arrow. And he does this so he doesn't die. What does it mean? He puts it on the fire, which is in the coal pan. If he doesn't do it properly, he's liable for death. If he deviates. And actually, this verse might seem innocuous, right? It seems innocuous, right? This became one of the greatest, um, this became one of the greatest points of contention. Um, in the ancient world between um, between the rabbis and the sectarians known as the Sadducees. Uh, and that is to say, the rabbis said that they poured the incense, oh, the fire, on, the incense onto the fire in the temple to make the cloud in the temple. But the Sadducees said that, the, that he, they poured it outside the Holy of Holies and then walked into the Holy of Holies with it already making a cloud. And that became a big source of fighting. And if the high priest was a sectarian, 
then he was he was going to be put to death. And rabbis, there was a lot of tension about that. There was a lot of suspicion that the high priests were not following the rabbis and they were following the sect of Kohanim. So it might seem like an innocuous verse, but they were fighting to the death over this, literally. Hard to imagine that in a religious context, people would fight. No, it's not hard to imagine. That was a joke. Yeah. People fight all the time in religious contexts. They're passionate beyond words, and that causes them to fight. I was just arguing today that we. What? I was just arguing today. One thing about Judaism is we're humble and we do not fight. Yeah, we fight over, plenty. Well, we fight amongst ourselves, but we don't fight telling other people they should think the way we do. We're taught from childhood yeah. to be humble, not to uh, think that ours right. is any better. Yeah, it's basically correct. Yeah. I'm sorry, Steve, I cut you off also. Did I cut you off? Yeah, I, I, I don't understand. Oh, the... Uh, the rabbis versus the... Oh, so the rabbi versus... said that it's, it says, where is the Anana Katoris? Where is he supposed to make the pillar of cloud over the incense? Outside and then walk into the Holy of Holies with the smoke? Or the smoke should be made only once you're already in there? Okay. It's based upon a different verse. The verse says, Lefnei Hashem. And we have to look up the exact citation in Yoma, which discusses this at length. But that's the source. So, Rabbi, I, I don't want to go so much into the argument, but if, if the only consequence was that the high priest would die if he did it wrong, and the, the people will still be atoned for, yeah. why, do the, why do these the Pharisees care so much if this high priest dies. Like it's, no, no, they were, why they were am I worried. responsible for somebody else's they death? They wanted to make sure that they, everybody was following the rabbis and not the Pharisees, not right, the Sadducees. But, but I'm asking if, if the only consequence would be that he would die and that yeah. the people would still be atoned for, no matter what happened with the high priest. Oh, why do they care what he did? They want to do it right. It, to the to point where they're willing to, to no, you know, I destroy the shalom him. between people and yeah, it's a good question. That Shem would take care of him, right? But, so that, uh, yeah. they, had a, they had the biggest fights that were between the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the temple. Okay, we'll stop here. After Padava Mincha, we'll stop here. But the, uh, the temple priests were Sadducees, right?